So I'm really thrilled that today we have with us Mark Raggett and Elisa Kane from the Portland Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. I wanted to hear more about how architects and planners could help their initiatives and what are the kind of complex motivations and the ways that you orchestrate something so amazingly difficult as turning a city green. So I think it's really exciting that we have the leaders from both of the divisions here. Alisa Kane manages the Green Building Program and in the Bureau. She works on green capital improvement projects, policy initiatives, educational outreach, and partnership development. She has a master's in urban and regional planning from the well-known Portland State University program and has spent the last 16 years working in the field of green building, community development, and recycling. Mark Raggett heads the urban design studio at the same Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. He's worked for the city of Portland for nine years in almost all parts of the city, implementing urban design redevelopment, sorry, objectives on projects ranging from streetgate, streetscape design details to district redevelopment master plans to new urban design concepts for the city. Mark is a graduate of the University of Oregon Portland Architecture Program, so we're thrilled to have one of our own. So I don't know which of you is going to start first, but... Okay, I'm going to try this. wanted to go over some of the incentives and maybe I think you might characterize them as disincentives that are happening around this. So these are areas that you can get involved in and try to help change as, as we look to the future. We're going to spend a little bit of time on one project just because it brings together things very nicely and really it, as a call out to you as the future and hopefully I can hand my baton off to you very soon here um, about what you can do to get trained and, and to get out there in this profession. So briefly on what the city is doing in terms of Building. So this is the, the green building program that has been around since year 2000. It's one of the first green building programs in the country. And as you might know, the, the landscape for green building has changed significantly. But very early on, the city saw an opportunity to lead the way um, and become the first city in the country to pass a green building policy for its own facilities. So that means anytime we build something, it either has to meet some LEED standards. Everyone know what LEED is? What does it stand for? Anybody? an acronym for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, and it's a program out of the U.S. Green Building Council, and so just so we, we're all aware of what that means. Um, so we have based this on LEED, so new facilities need to be built for LEED gold, and then we have some around existing facilities, LEED silver, and then a whole bunch of kind of performance targets. And it's been an interesting process to watch, because the city is a major landowner in the city of Portland. Uh, we have about 316 buildings and over 7 million square feet of property. So if you think about what we could do in the city, we saw this as an opportunity to lead. Since then, I would say the private sector has really kind of stretched quite a bit and has well surpassed the city in what, what they're able to do. So I'm thinking of even this building, some of the brewery block development, some of them that you see on the east side. And really, we are, um, as a city, one with the most lead buildings in the country. I will characterize that as per capita, though. So there are some others. Cities like New York City and Chicago that actually have more numerical in number of green buildings, but Portland still leads the way, and that's L E A D. So, so the city uh, the city policy is up and running. Um, I'm proud to point out that we do have a lead platinum facility. It's in East Portland. It's a community center. Um, it's the swimming pool addition that you see there. It's really cool. I just I, I just have to say if you if you like to go swimming, you have kids. It's a great place to take them. Um, it's it's dips energy in water. It saves about a million gallons per year of water because of their innovative green technologies that they're using. And it's very well daylit, so they barely have to turn the lights on. And it is so popular that it is one of those places that you have to get there early so that you can actually get in the pool. So it's called the East Portland Community Center. It's in Gateway. 
So about like a 106th and yeah, off of Stark, Washington, exactly. South Stark. So kind of dovetailing with the uh, city's policy, we have a construction waste program, and the city's had a construction waste requirement that uh, at least up until 19, starting in 1998 and up until 2007, you had to recycle 50% of all your construction waste. We um, improved that quite a bit, now it's to 75%. And yet still, just to better it, this, we say that for city facilities, city projects, you have to recycle 85%. And fortunately, in Portland, this is relatively easy to attain. We have a lot of facilities that will take construction waste. Um, but it's something that you, as architects, have to be very kind of up at the front end in your specs to make sure that this is what's going to happen after appeal. And so it's not just recycling. It's also meaning reusing materials, restoring, rehabilitating, salvaging, and making sure that things don't go in the landfill. And who can tell me why that's an important thing? What are some reasons why you want to do that? It's green. Okay, so what, what's green about it? So it's an asset instead of a piece of waste. Yeah. I, I like to think about it actually as that. So instead of a liability, waste, you have to pay to get rid of it. So by not paying for it, you're saving money, you're keeping it out of the landfill. Landfills are generally contributing to greenhouse gas emissions, um, certainly space, transportation dollars, all those things that you save by not throwing things out. Then on the reuse side, you're actually creating jobs. So I, I actually ask every one of you to go to the rebuilding center or Habitat Restore to see this in action. These are things that we're taking liabilities and making them into assets. So living wage jobs are being created out of waste. And then also we're preserving kind of Portland's past and certainly looking around this building there's evidence of you know trees these were our forests and they're all still here they're still in service they'll be of service for another hundred or three hundred years there's no reason that material should ever be landfill so our construction waste program is kind of blossoming right now we're working on kind of the next iteration to make it very easy for contractors especially to know what to do with the waste to know how to meet our requirements and probably within the next year you'll see the, the, the big rollout of that program we have a green building hotline too. So this is something I'm fairly proud of. We um, joined forces with Metro and the other counties in the region, Clackamas and Washington County, and offer a free regional green building hotline. And so we have an architect who staffs the hotline and she answers about a thousand calls a year. She also does a lot of outreach and she will answer pretty much anything. And I, 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 I used to sit next to her so I would hear what she was, what she was talking about. And, and no, you cannot wrap your house in bubble wrap. Um, that was one of the questions. Someone had thought that that would be a good idea for saving energy. But so you can, and I would encourage you as a student if you have questions about materials, incentives, um, other strategies. Even she's doing a lot of job counseling right now. Um, that's good number. So I have that at the end here. So um, I'll give that to you. Um, you can tell her I sent you. Um, the city is working a lot in the renewables. So we are trying to get more solar, more wind in Portland. And I, how many of you think solar is a good idea? So just, you know, the, the tagline is it, is, it is sunny enough for solar in Portland, even though we have days like today. And it really can pencil out. Part of it has to do with that we have some good incentives, which we'll go over in a minute. And also, too, it, it really helps us reduce our reliance on foreign oil and locally coal. We still heat and cool our buildings with coal. About 50% of the energy we use in Portland is from coal. Only 1% is from renewables. It's really time for us to meet the other goals that we're going to talk about as a city to change that dynamic. We also are working on code updates. You know, the, the building code is something that is set at the state level. Um, locally, we have a little bit of flexibility, and there is a process that our bureau puts forward every year. I don't think we'll be doing it this year, but it's a regulatory improvement process, and it allows us to work with the community to identify barriers in the code for getting things done that, that actually will benefit the community. So this last year, we had a whole green bundle, and we looked at things around solar, siting, even biomass, so how can we have enough collection area on your site to be able to use that as an energy source. Um, those are things that had to be fixed in the zoning code, for example. Um, wind turbines, there's, there's some issues around height and, and density requirements in there, so that was something that, that had to get fixed. And so it's all these little tweakings that add up to reducing the barriers that would prevent green and sustainable building. So that's something that has actually been interesting to witness from afar, so I wasn't heavily involved in it, but it really shows that you know, the city can get out of the way. We can either be, become a barrier or we can get out of the way and really help foster sustainable and green development. And then finally, the past 
two and a half years, uh, my program's been working on a policy, what I call a community-wide green building policy. Um, and it's a way to help add incentives to green buildings, to high-performance buildings, and it's also a way to look at existing buildings um, and to ensure that our existing buildings are as energy efficient, as healthy, as, uh, as prolonged as possible. Um, I would have to say candidly that this is a tough time to sell anything on buildings because certainly the development community you know, hears the word fees and I, I think that I start seeing pitchforks when that, when that word comes up. So we're cautious right now, but it is a policy we've been working on. It may come out of the woodwork at some point if the, if the, uh, if the timing is right. And what we would have are potentially fees and rebates for building high performing buildings. So it, it got a lot of attention in the media a couple of years ago when it first came out. We've still been working on it, but we haven't been as public about it. But I am still trying to put it forward because I don't want the development community to be surprised that suddenly we have the opportunity politically, economically to pass this that it comes forward. So. I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand what the community policy is that's different than the individual facilities or individual buildings. Okay, so the policy for our own facilities, the city's okay. facilities, that's that is only for the capital projects that the city does. The community wide policy would be for all buildings. So any developer that was going to build a building, th this policy would be triggered. And there would be ways to avoid the fees, and that's what we want. We want people to avoid the fees. But if you're just going to build the code, and you're not going to do any performance, and not going to try to pursue lease, then what we were looking at, at least, was as assessing a fee. Um, so it, it has us. And then if you do really well, let's say you, you perform very well, we'll actually issue you a check at the city. It's called a fee bait mechanism. And you can use that as a party, really. I know I do. Um, I want to talk about sites really quickly, that there are a lot of initiatives to green up the sites in Portland. Um, any guess where this eco roof is? So, no and no. Um, <laughs> So this is actually on our favorite Michael Graves building. Portland building. Portland building, yeah. Uh, this is, there's 18,000 square feet of eco roof up there that almost nobody sees unless you work across the tower. But that, that was part of our city facility policy that any roof replacement is to get an eco roof. And it's one of the more handsome eco roofs, actually. You can't get up there unless, you know, you, you well, you can't get up there. Um, but you can see it if you go across the street and ask the people in the tower, if you go up to the 24th floor, you can see it. And it's been featured in all sorts of magazines. And it is a proud moment for the Portland building, I would say. They're doing a lot of studies on how, how inclusive it is, how much water it, it actually does, or stormwater it does capture, and how many birds and other insects are coming through there. So it is a little bit of a laboratory. Um, the city of Portland has some very aggressive plans to add eco roofs. They, they have an initiative to add about 45 acres of eco roofs. Over the next five years, we're in about year two of that. They, they're calling this Rated Green Initiative. They also want to add Green Street amenities. Has everyone seen Green Streets out there? So it's a combination of, of pavement and these, um, I don't have a picture of it, but these uh, vegetated ditches that allow the stormwater to, to infiltrate more slowly. It also reduces pollution, runoff. Um, and now, more interestingly, and maybe you saw this article, that Mayor Adams is trying to combine these Green Street facilities with bikeway improvements. And so we'll see if we're able to marry multiple objectives at the city level. I've also noticed, um, personally, just as the city has become more and more stringent on what you can do on your site and requiring you to handle all your stormwater on site through their stormwater management manual, that we're starting to see a different flavor of development. Even our parking lots look different. And so I'm, and now, after a couple of years of this management manual being more and more aggressive, I think it's changing the landscape, or literally the landscape of the city. And, and, and I, I would say it's, it's benefiting us all. Um, our parking lots and our, our building surrounds are, are, are doing their job. And we need to do this as a city because federally, they no longer want us to dump pollution in the Willamette River. What do you know? And um, this is part of the, the big overall initiative to keep pollution levels down, improve habitat, and actually beautify the city. So, um, thanks, Lisa. So I'm I'm Mark Raggett again, and I'm with uh, I lead the Urban Design Studio at the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, and I've been there again, like Nancy said, about nine years or so. And um, 
This is the Urban Design Studio is kind of is a neat little, uh, it's a program sort of of the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. And again, it sort of um, harkens back to kind of the 60, you know, before planning, land use plan, transportation planning came into be its profession in and of itself back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. So in the past few decades, planning has really taken off as a profession in and of itself. Prior to that, there was a lot of designers, frankly, that did planning for multiple cities around sort of internationally as well as sort of this country and Portland specifically. So before you know, I would say 1970 or so, a lot of the people who worked as planners in the city were actually trained as landscape architects, architects, designers of some kind, typically planning, or an engineer, frankly, lots of engineers. So uh, planning wasn't a profession um, in, in its own right until a few decades later. Since then, in the city of Portland, what happened is planning took off, and we got a big uh, nationally renowned pro program over here in PSU, the Masters of Urban and Regional Planning program. Planning became a lot stronger, and the number of designers in the Bureau of Planning, that was then called the Bureau of Planning, declined to the point where there, there were no more designers or even people trained as designers or architects, landscape architects, etc. cetera. Um, I was hired in the late 90s as sort of a new move to kind of bring more of the design perspective back into the Bureau and sort of use urban design as a lens to look at redevelopment, especially of a lot of areas of town in the central city and outside that we were anticipating a lot of new growth and the kind of the creation of new urban places. So again, part of this is again, and I've worked frankly a lot with uh, the University of Oregon as well as PSU, in terms of um, looking at different parts of town. This is a little graphic from uh, the interstate corridor over here, if people recognize this. So this is the interstate light rail line and looking at the station locations along the way and kind of where we expect to see a lot, you know, the biggest sort of concentration of density in sort of this area between interstate and the freeway where we kind of expect to see some pretty radical transformation. Again, not overnight. Planning is again, land use transportation planning is generally on a 20 year horizon plus or minus, 20 or 30 years. Some of you may already know that. So things don't happen immediately. So a lot of this is telling a story about a future place that doesn't may or may not exist there today, but kind of trying to get people excited and interested in the vision for the future that, again, is, you know, pretty highly urban and dense, or and a lot denser usually than what's out there today. So these are some principles that, you know, uh, we, we employ. The, and again, the Urban Design Studio, one of the lens we bring, again, is the design process. Again, what goes on here at the University of Oregon Architecture Department that I, again, am an alumnus of, you know, employing the design process, looking at the existing conditions, exploring the context, documenting all that studying some alternatives and then going through an evaluation process that's usually multi-agency and with a lot of private sector help in a lot of cases, but I work a lot with the Bureau of Transportation, Parks Bureau, Bureau of Environmental Services that Lisa talked a little bit about. We work internally with Lisa, the Green Building Service, as well as Historic Resources Programs. It's sort of, and TriMet Metro, there's a broad ODOT, a broad range of partners at sort of the level, at this level of planning, where again, you're thinking about what is the future of an area and how can we help make the best decisions for major capital improvement projects like light, light rail or freeway improvement or new streetscape improvement projects, that kind of stuff. Those are big ticket items. But again, you need to kind of think about uh, a much larger context and the way, and the way, the way that that part of the community may change or not, frankly. So these are uh, fairly self-explanatory, but you know, we, we think we're thinking about places for people, creating new places in sort of an urban setting. And again, they may already exist, but we're interested in enhancing them and making them better. Part of this, again, is to make density work. So get, get urban environments in the city of Portland to work well. And again, that's thinking about the public space, connections, that, that kind of stuff, to and from these places. But we're thinking about people, again, and how do people use the urban environment and the landscape around them. The connections piece, you know, this is an example of sort of thinking about the connections. The light rail running north-south on interstate is connecting to some major east-west, sort of north-northeast Portland corridors here. How are those connections today? How can they be enhanced? And what, you know, what's the difference in sort of the community along the way here in the neighborhoods on both sides of light rail alignment? Enhance the existing, this is an example, Lisa and I were just walking around here. We have a, a deep, a deep well, a deep pool of sort of existing historic resources. This is this building, the school here, and adaptive reuse is a big part of it. There are also lots of parts of the city, and again, these may be open space or parks, Peninsula Park is another example. There are open spaces sort of around the city that need, that we, we need to kind of wrap our arms around and embrace and enhance, and how can we do that with new development? But we need to figure out what those are, and they may be, right now in East Portland, for example, we have an issue with landscaping and a lot of big trees, a lot of conifer, coniferous Douglas fir trees. Those are coming out at sort of an alarming rate, especially in private property, as we want to, we have this wrestling match now between our density goals and sort of uh, these key pieces of the character of the different parts of the community. And again, East Portland, a big part of it is coniferous fir trees. And so we're losing them, sort of, we're losing a lot of those trees getting cut down in the interest of sort of creating higher density development. That's just one little example there. Um, embrace the future, again, kind of speaks for itself, right? We need to kind of get on board, and the green building, uh, green building and sort of the sustainability move is a big part of that future, and we need to kind of figure out what that, that may mean. And again, that may mean a lot of buildings that look different than the way buildings look today. And again, building technologies are changed, the design profession is changing. We need to kind of get on board and, f and figure that out. 
leading by example, again, the green, the green building, part of it, sustainability is a way to lead by example. The city, we need to kind of figure out what that future is going to look like and get out and do it and figure out which leads in the last one, which is making it happen. The 20-year the vision is a key part of getting a lot of the community, the public agencies, et cetera, on board with the direction and how to spend money and make public investments in an area. But we also need to think about small-scale improvements to get, you know, again, at the human scale to figure out we may need a curb cut here just to facilitate people in wheelchairs or something to get down to the light rail station. So we need some near-term, you know, we need a park improvement project. We need to figure out where, you know, how we're going to reuse the Kenton School site or how the, a part of that site may be able to be reused. Good. Yeah. How much are you interfacing with? Uh, well, quite a bit, and especially recently, as sort of the, the eco district piece has begun to come together. So, yeah, definitely. Rob Bennett actually used to work at Office of Sustainable Development for a while. So, yeah, that's a big part. Eco districts is a big, a big part of the future, I think. Um, so, this is, and this is kind of quickly an example of some of some of the, the work we do. Well, I mean, just a little bit about this, this last one here. This is, this is looking at the new light rail bridge here, the Portland Milwaukee. This is the OHSU Snitsa campus here, the Markham Bridge, Ross Island right here. This is the new proposed Willamette River Transit Bridge, sort of that'll go in between them. And again, this is the OMSI district. Here's OMSI. This is, and this is Division Street. This is a personal wrestling match of my own here. But Division kind of Division goes in a straight line way out there, 15 miles to Gresham. It's one of the only streets, frankly, in the city of Portland to do that in almost an unbroken straight line. It gets to within, you know, seven, six or seven blocks site of the MLK Viaduct in the Willamette River, and kind of gets diverted onto um, Division Place. This is actually called Division here. Division Place kind of continues. And you know, this is a real opportunity for creating a, a major sort of river kind of connection and sort of fitting into a major city corridor that right now is kind of a little, little unsung. And then again, how do we make that a big public place? We bring the boat, you know, we kind of connect to the river in a more meaningful way here. We think about redevelopment around here in the new employment kind of center. We're sort of at the gateway to kind of the central east side, which is a major industrial sanctuary. At least, and we're also talking about this a little earlier. What is the future of sort of employment in this area? And again. The industrial kind of uses in there are transitioning, and we have a major regional attraction here that's uh, in OMSI that's about to be strengthened by the Oregon Rail Heritage Foundation. Sort of the Portland 3 uh, city owned steam locomotives are going to land in a new home here, hopefully, in the near future, as a, kind of related to this light rail project. So, thinking about this, thinking about again on the west, uh, across the river in the central city, and again, I should say we work all over the city. We do a lot of the biggest and most and fastest moving projects are in the central city, so we do do a big chunk of our work is in the central city. Um, and that's why you're going to see a few central city examples here. Um, this is again uh, Hawthorne Bowl right in here. This is the Hawthorne Bowl, Hawthorne Bridge, sort of a big gateway, the new first and main building here. A lot of the city streets on the west side of the river, this side of the river, frankly, right out here, Ankeny is one of the few that actually kind of projects itself across NATO Parkway into the park. Most, almost all of our other streets end at NATO Parkway. You know, this is Portland was founded on the river. We're sitting in some of the oldest buildings of the city. They're here because of the Willamette River. They all had wars on them and all kinds of boats and types for ships and, and industrials for maritime economy that's kind of long gone from this source of the Willamette River. Right now, we kind of have a big kind of barrier and sort of a line drawn at NATO Parkway. So none of these streets kind of flow into the park and take you in an east-west direction to this Willamette River. A lot of our public realm orientation in the central city in this part is running in the north-south. And so we kind of had to figure out how to kind of turn the park blocks, ideally, 90 degrees and head down to the Willamette River. Uh, that you know happens in some other cities. This is the north park blocks. This is the custom, customs house you kind of see in the background there. And you know, are there some ideas about reclaiming some of that? We have lots and lots of rights away. I'm glad Elisa brought up the built square footage the city has. In the city of Portland, in the central city, 40% of the land area is in public rights away, like that which is almost, if you think about that, that's almost half the land area of the, in the central city being used to access the other half, which from a high density development standpoint may not make the most sense. That's a lot of streets out there. So, and that's a huge part of the central city. The city wide is about 18%. It's almost a fifth of the land area of the city of Portland is in streets as well. So if you think about that, that's a huge resource that the city controls. And again, like, like Elisa began talking about, there are lots of new things in terms of, this is sort of more of an urban thing, but how can we reclaim some of that in the North Park blocks and maybe, again, emphasize the connection between these small half block size parks for public space, again, you know, public art, all kinds of stuff. Um, but how can we reclaim that and be more multifunctional? Again, like, like Elisa said, stormwater management, public space, gathering, that kind of thing, and kind of de-emphasizing the transportation kind of throughput. A lot of these streets look the same in Central City. Lots of two sidewalks on both sides, paved roadway, that kind of thing. So. Um, we need to be probably more strategic as we move forward into the future. Um, and I'm going to get back to Lisa here. So just some of the things that we're working on now out in the community. So I talk a lot about 
how we interface internally. Uh, we are working on a Solar Now campaign, and this is a way to really help streamline the, solar, the provisions of solar on your either commercial or residential structure. We've done a lot of work around the permitting process, so it's as easy as a, if they, you can file for an electronic permit. It's very affordable, $5 uh, to get your trade permit. You still have to, to pay for the plumbing or electrical permit, but they really try to reduce the barriers there. They do a lot of education and outreach. This has spun out into, I think, a really fascinating community initiative, which is called Solarize Portland. And this is uh, neighbors in Northeast and Southeast have uh, bonded together to become a buying group, uh, be able to buy solar panels at a very reduced cost. And so this is, a, I think, a very innovative way to address some of the kind of first costs of putting solar on. They've been able to take up to a 20 to 50 percent, I've heard some of the bids, or 20 to 50 percent less than what it would have been had they just been so if you live in that area and you want to get involved, I know they're, they're still soliciting uh, participants, and the more people that come on, the, the more affordable it gets. And I really appreciate this because I know that I think everyone should have access to this technology, and this, this really allows that to happen. We just have a unit put on our house, and we used it for that first year, and it, it really is amazing because of tax incentives and all that. Southeast and Northeast, although their boundaries are a little bit generous, I would say. They're generous, and, and there's also an initiative that's just um, I just read a week and a half, two weeks ago, in Southern and Southwest as well. That answered one of the one of the sort of conflicts that they uh, identified was that it bundled all of the work into a single installer, and other people in the industry felt left out. <coughs> in Southwest, they they. smaller installers so they could also, so that the buying would still be uh, communal, so they could still get the price break on the materials, but the installation could be spread out among a, a variety of, of businesses. So it really is spreading. Uh, for Southeast, the, the contact is Southeast Uplift. Uh, I'm not sure who's heading in the Northeast, but I know that they have a, another project going on. Thank you for that. Um, it just shows what a little innovation can do solve problems together much more readily than just singularly. Uh, in a similar fashion, the city has launched a program called Clean Energy Works. Uh, this is another innovative program, I would say. It allows on what is called on-bill financing of energy efficiency improvements. Right now, it's just for the residential market. So let's say you have a home, you want to add insulation, do duct sealing, do some uh, deep energy retrofit. You can go through Clean Energy Works. Uh, it's a low interest rate loan, a very low interest rate loan, but the, the loan repayment appears on your utility bill. And so this allows you to just pay it off very easily. And also when you start realizing the savings from the energy efficiency, you'll see your bill go down, but you'll, you'll be repaying that, that loan. Uh, this was made possible at least by an infusion of uh, stimulus money. And the city has gone out for much more money through the stimulus uh, uh, packages. And hopefully in the next couple We've been hearing this for a while, but hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll hear back from the federal government up to $75 million in being able to make these financing options available. And then we've also extended out to the commercial market as well. So they're, they're in pilot phase right now. They want to do 500 homes uh, by the beginning of this, this summer, and then it will be launched uh, citywide for anyone who wants to do these energy retrofits. And they can be as, as small as doing the duct sealing, but it's all tested out. So they're, they're engaging professionals, Energy Trust of Oregon, We'll send out professionals to do a home audit, really identify the most and <coughs> the most opportunities that you have, and you know you then get in touch with a contractor. You really it's really a turnkey energy efficiency upgrade. And Portland's pretty unique in this way. Uh, Berkeley has a different model where they do it on property tax repayment, and that that tax bill then lives with the house. This one you would have to repay just like a line of equity if you sold your house. Another uh, thing that we have available for the community is called the Best Business Center. And if you're a business in Portland, you are allowed to call this one-stop shop for information on recycling, uh, climate-reducing strategies, so certainly around transportation, 
um, of composting. It really just allows you as a business to call the city and get hooked up to all the free resources that are out there. And they actually send a sustainability professional out there to do help you with an audit. They check back in with you over six months. And then at the end, they actually reward you with recognition that you're part of this program. And then finally, we're also out there now talking about how you can help uh, save our climate through our Climate Action Now plan. And when I talk about the Climate Action Plan, this is really where we're starting to see this plan, which lives in a paper document, hit the road. So how many of you have read this Climate Action Plan? Required reading for everyone in this room. Okay, so this is a roadmap for Portland of how we're going to manage our, manage to get our greenhouse gas emissions down 80% by 2050. Very ambitious. Fortunately, Portland's a good pro at this. We were the first city in North America to have a climate action plan in 1993, literally on this little floppy disk. Um, but we've become very well known internationally for being a city that's done this. It's set goals that are similar to the Kyoto Protocol. And in fact, Portland's doing quite well on that. As last I heard, we're about 1% below 1990 levels. And this was with constant uh, population growth. But 1% is not going to get us 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. So the, the, the action plan outlines 93 action areas. And buildings are one of the biggest areas. And why is that? Why are, why are buildings such an important focus of this plan? They're such big use in your community. Right, exactly. So, so buildings use the most, uh, are, are, are responsible for the most climate uh, emission in Portland at 40%. And so that's above transportation and that's above industry. Industries and transportation are split in, in the, after that. So our buildings are, are the biggest energy users, biggest water users, and actually pose the most opportunity for us to reduce those emissions. Um, so I know my program is starting to work more towards this goal. Like we, we, we did a lot of education and outreach about materials and construction waste. Now we're really trying to focus on, on greenhouse gas and especially carbon. And that's where you, I talked about that policy, that kind of thing response to that. We're trying to help make Portland more efficient and also trying to provide those resources to do that. But it really, this is really important for you as architects to know about this. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Architecture 2030? Okay, good. That's, that's a good, that, that will help us get on that path. And for those who don't know, it's posing net zero buildings by 2030, and that puts us on a, a ratcheting goal, increasing increasingly more difficult goal of getting to net zero buildings by 2030. And so I'm looking to you to make that happen. And I feel like if you're out there working or if you will be working in firms, you need to get your firm signed on to this initiative. And I think that will set you apart from your colleagues just to say, you know, this is where the, the future is going to be. This is where we need to be going as a profession. You know, bring this to the table. And there's starting to be more trainings about it. I know AIA Code often offers trainings about architecture. So what does it mean? I mean, it's one thing to have a goal, but it's one thing to put pen to paper and design something that meets that. So you know, that's where I would call on your expertise to make that happen. We have a couple other initiatives that are happening based on some of these uh, kind of bigger picture goals. Right. So this is a boring bullet slide again. Sorry about that. So the first one is um, the Portland plan. People heard of the Portland plan that's going on right now? Yeah. Yes. So the uh, Nancy. Um, so. Um, Four key phases to this plan. And again, like Elisa just said, this is part of this is again beginning to think strategically about how we implement some of those, uh, a lot of the goals that are in that climate action plan. Four key phases. The first one is kind of complete, which is this fact checking phase, where again, and actually we were right here in this in this space, um, kind of talking about a bunch of facts about the city. Um, we're in the in the middle and getting into this setting direction phase. So we're, we're compiling a lot of objectives. There's nine action areas. These again are things we're trying to break out of the silo. Here's here's planning over here, and here's transportation over here, and here's parks over here, and here's environmental services over there. We're trying to get it. And actually, here's Metro TriMet, very broad constituent of sort of public partners here, public agencies. So Metro TriMet, City of Portland, all these kinds of agencies, school districts, etc. Um, how do we spend? So and again, the, the global thing. So actually, just one more step back here. The global goal here is we spend about $9 billion roughly within the city of Portland boundaries. And again, that's a whole bunch of agencies doing a whole bunch of projects. How can we be more strategic about spending those dollars to achieve the community's goals and where we think the city needs to go? So, and that's the school district spending money, and that's ODOT spending money, and that's Bureau of Transportation spending money, and parks, all kinds of people, city of Portland um, spending money. How can we be more strategic about that $9 billion and let's focus those dollars? And again, like Lisa talked about with the, with the bike boulevards and the green streets, but we're beginning to kind of see some synergies there that makes we get more bang for our buck. We're going to tear the street up. Let's put as much as we can in that. Make it as multifunctional as possible. So here's the objectives. We have nine action areas, which again are 
um, trying to break down the silo structure, I'll say. You know, so instead of land use transportation, there's kind of, you know, connect, communication and access, something like that. And instead of, you know, um, fire and life safety, it's kind of human human health kind of safety, you know, that kind of thing. It's kind of not police, fire, and all. It's not broken down that way. It's talked about more in a global kind of way. So environment, natural environment, and um, there's nine of them. One of them is planning, design, and um, public spaces, which is one that I've been working a lot on. And I encourage you to come to some of the workshops. We had a big workshop the other day at the you can trust building. Um, we're in the um, setting direction, which means identifying a bunch of objectives, like the 20-minute neighborhoods concept. Have people heard about that? That's kind of, again, an urban forum kind of concept. Um, and again, it's building on a lot of the success of the inner neighborhoods in Portland, so around Hawthorne or Belmont or North, North Northeast, Alberta, Mississippi. How do we kind of get that kind of pattern to occur in more parts of the city? Right now, it's prevalent in sort of the streetcar era neighborhood, which is again out to about 82nd. The saw a lot of streetcars back to the 20s and 30s. It's not as prevalent east of 82nd all the way out to 162nd, and it's you know where that area never saw streetcars. They never got out there in the first place. It's all used to be rural agricultural land. It's not as prevalent in the West Hills and Southwest in that direction, where we have a lot of topography and a lot of environmental issues that kind of get in the way of kind of a rec you know pretty comprehensive street grid. So how do we kind of get you know the 20 minute neighborhood kind of thing to happen out there? Um, yeah. Well, that's, so that's a good question. That's part of the. I think they're going to move away from actually using the term 20 minute because that's exactly kind of the question that keeps coming up. What does 20 minute mean? Is that walking 20 minutes? Is that riding your bike 20 minutes? Is that if you ride a bus for 20 minutes, you can be in Gresham? You know. Well, it's, I wouldn't say it's, it's clearly defined. I think it's going to move probably away from 20 minute neighborhood to more like complete neighborhood or, you know, something else that's a little broader and less of it sounds like a geographic boundary I mean, in terms of answering that. Um, I can't say officially, but that's kind of, that's a very good question that keeps coming up. Um, the third phase will be strategy building, so kind of taking a lot of these objectives and figuring out what are some broad strategies. Again, the, the 20 minute, I'll say the complete neighborhoods or whatever concept is a strategy that we could begin to think about how, would, how do we implement that. Um, and another one is, is a green, maybe a city green, a network of bikeways, habitat corridors, and big civic boulevards might be another one, as well as the central city, and where is the central city going to go? I just had a quick kind of question, if anyone knows, little factoids. Um, Portland's density, anyone know what Portland's density, roughly about 134 square miles, we get about 500, 600,000 people, that works out to roughly about six, you know, six, uh, six dwellings per acre-ish, in terms of residential population. You know where that sits relative to Los Angeles? The city we love to hate. Anyone? It's about half. LA is, is twice as dense as Portland. And the city of Vancouver, British Columbia is the same population in a third the land area. So they're about 18 units per acre. So and then this is just residential populations. But just to give you a, a scope, Portland is a, is kind of spread out. We're about Denver level of density right now. So you know, a lot of this 20 minute neighborhood success is built on sort of density working well, right? And you know we're nowhere near Paris and Tokyo are kind of off the charts, just to kind of put that in perspective. Sort of, they, don't, they don't register. But Los Angeles is twice as dense as sort of Portland. Again, this is like a city boundary and a residential population. Los Angeles has lots and lots of people living in it. You know, like it or not, it's not really you know, working from a transportation perhaps very well, but from a density standpoint, they have those boulevards have active retail storefronts just on and on and on as far as you can see. You know, we have spots along Hawthorne that are active, dense, right, between 34th and 39th-ish, we have pieces of Belmont, and pieces of Mississippi, and pieces of Alberta, but it's not the whole thing, and it's not, you know, as far as you can see to the horizon. So density makes a lot of things happen, and is incredibly green. If you think about it, people can just walk right out their door. In Paris, little green grocers are sort of, you know, we'd walk out of this building, and you'd be able to look three directions and see a grocery store, a butcher shop, and a little bakery, right? And that works because you have five-story, eight-story buildings consistently kind of all around them. We had that in very few places, actually. Kind of just in downtown, we have a little bit river district. South Waterfront a little bit, but kind of nowhere else. And we have aspirations for that, though, at a lot of light rail stations, a whole bunch of light rail stations, and also five town centers and one regional center gateway, which is sort of an interesting thing to think about. And again, we can think about what does that mean? And again, getting back to Elise's, the, the climate action plan, that 80% reduction in carbon, from an urban form perspective, what does that mean and how do we get there? One way is just to go to every single house and re insulate the crap out of it, frankly, and you know get it to work efficiently, which is what may, may be the easiest and most cost-effective way to do that. Another way is to think, well, from a density standpoint, how do we move people around? Where do we put new development? Like maybe we just put people in Gateway and just the central city, or we just put them in the central city. We have the Lloyd District on the east side of the river. It can be, there's almost a start from scratch kind of landscape. I'm kind of, I'm being glib. We have a lot of the Pearl District still to go, north of Lovejoy, and we have a lot of South Waterfront still, still buildable. Not to mention the West End and this historic district, there's lots of open parcels here to build on. We have a lot of development capacity in the central city just for starters. 
just to kind of get us to maybe a level of density where we may want to be, which would relieve a lot of pressure, frankly, on anywhere outside of that. But anyway, that's kind of the global, that's actually, oops, part of this next one, Central City. So related to this, we're going to be updating the Central City Plan. The last thing I'll say about this, this is this will update the city's comprehensive plan, which was last done in 1980, before a lot of that East Portland, which was mid-county, was annexed to the city. So again, the, this, the, the comprehensive plan was drawn up in 1980, just looking out to about 82nd, and I'm using rough boundaries here. But again, that streetcar era city that people know, you know of Portland. A lot of the East Portland, and a huge, a huge part of where the development energy and activity has been going on, which is east of 82nd, was annexed later. So that the, the comprehensive plan did not sort of take that into account. Related to kind of where we're sitting right now, we'll be updating the city's 1988 uh, central city plan, and that's going to have a few key new pieces. One is a new policy framework, which again addresses a lot of new issues, a lot of new things. A lot, a lot has changed since 1988. We'll get a new urban design concept out of that. We'll get four quadrant plans. The central city is going to be divided into four segments. Right now it's divided into eight sub-districts. And these boundaries are just kind of planner level boundaries. They're not really like recognized neighborhood boundaries. I don't expect anyone in the room here to get the exact boundary of the Lloyd district or the South Waterfront or whatever. But part of this is to break them into bigger chunks so we can you know, uh, use our resources more efficiently, which again, like Nancy already said, are lower than they used to be. And again, coming out of this, and again, Thinking about implementation, sort of that big, what's the big idea, but also how do we kind of make this stuff, begin to think about making this stuff happen. How do we do that? So that's kind of the central city. That's a piece just to kind of think about that, that, that is a part of the Portland plan work. And then I'm going to start talking about this and then hand it back to Lisa. We have, in terms of carrots, so these are, again, how do we get private developers, other people out there to do the kind of things we want them to do? We do have a lot of incentives or, or you know, carrots is another way to think about them right now. Um, these top two, again, are things that are Portland Zoning Code, Title 33, which I wouldn't recommend to anyone to go read because it's going to put you right to sleep and it's really big, it's really thick. Um, we have a bunch of what are called floor ratio density bonuses or height bonuses for doing things like that eco roof that um, uh, at least I showed you on the Portland building. So um, you can do eco roofs, you can do put a roof garden up there, you can put in a work of art, you can put in a daycare center, you can put in uh, a bike locker. You know, bike locker is a big one. Um, um, one of the issues, we have 18, I think 18 of these right now in the central city, and I'm speaking to the central city right now. The issue we're running into with this right now is the developers are beginning to do this anyway, right? So they're, they're going to build a building like this, or they're going to spend a lot of money to build a building. Their tenants are telling them, you know what, we want to ride our bikes, we want you to put a bike locker in the building. So put a bike locker in the building. So they're, gonna, they're already doing it anyway, and actually there's some cost incentive to them doing that because they can maybe build less parking. They don't want to build parking if they don't have to downtown because it's really expensive. So if they can do more things, be closer to the transit line, closer to the max line, build a lot of bike parking, you know, guess what? They start saving money. They don't have to build as much parking. And wow, all of a sudden they get a bonus. You know, they get a big bonus. So part of this is now we're starting to see, you know, building that, if they're going to do it anyway, maybe we shouldn't be rewarding them for doing something they're going to do anyway. In the Pearl District, one of the things was a residential bonus. You had to build like a few units and you get a three to one. You guys know flurry ratio. I'm sorry, I'm getting off topic here. Getting into the weeds. Floor ratio is a density. It's basically a re relationship between the site area and how much you can build, you know, build space. So for building, just, and again, back in 1988, that was all rail yards, right? The rail, river district's only about 10 years old. All that stuff is new from about Hoyt North. You know, it's really brand new kind of stuff. That was all rail yards. We had, there was a big interest in that notion of density to get more people living downtown to make the downtown work better. Central City, it happened. Okay, they're all there. A lot of that was built on a floor area ratio bonus for residential development, which means it's a pretty much a, Go ahead and talk about building residential. Just build a few units, and you get right off the bat 75 extra feet of height and three to one increased density, which is a big, it's a big reward, you know. But that's what we want. So you get a three to one bonus, and you get a 75 foot height increase. So you could build a bigger building, build build more units, basically, it's encouraging you to do that. So that's happened again, and then all of a sudden the market took off, you know, a few years later. And did we need to give them a bonus? You know, no, because they're they were doing it just you know hand over fist. We were seeing you know permits you know almost every every few weeks for a new building to come in the river district. There was a condo, river, you know, lots and lots of units, more and more and more. So we need to go back to this and again, based on some of where, maybe where we want to go aggressively with the climate action plan and think about what do we really want to get and how do we kind of get set the bar a little the carrot a little further out there. Because right now the rabbits are eating all the carrots we got in them left. You know, they're they're all gone. So how do we get set something out here which is maybe toward that eighty percent, you know, climate the the greenhouse gas reductions goal. What, what do we really need out here? And so, and how do we tailor an incentive that's going to work? A lot of our incentives don't get used. I'm getting way in the weeds here on this one. But um, a lot of our incentives don't work because it's just not market, they're not market feasible. They don't pencil out at the end of the day. The developers can't make them work. Even if they wanted to do them, they'd be really, really expensive. And they wouldn't get enough return in the bonus at the end of the day to make a pencil. The transfer development rights is something over this, this his designated historic landmarks have, you know, 
an un unbuilt, usually there's a cushion in there of unbuilt density and height that they don't, that they're not going to build. They're a historic landmark, right? We want to keep the building. So we want to keep buildings like this, this building and a lot of other buildings in the Skidmore Historic District. So what we do is we have a program that's called Transfer Development Rights where you can take, you, the, the property owner can sell that FAR and that height. And they can sell it somewhere else. You know, they can sell it to someone else. You can attach it to their building if they're in an eligible receiving site. This is getting a little complicated, but I'll stop there. So the notion is that we're protecting the historic landmarks. Seattle has a pretty neat, uh, even a more aggressive word to build in some parts of downtown Seattle. You must buy FAR. You must buy that density, that development potential from a historic landmark to ensure that that historic landmark will stay there. We don't, we're not, we don't point guns at people and tell them to do it. You know, like that, but we may, we may want to. You know, again, if we see if there's a real concern for the loss of historic, more of our historic fabric, you know, we may want to do that. But the notion here, again, is that we're, you know, we're allowing that density to go to stay in the city in a certain area, but just sell it off the historic structure so you preserve the historic structure and someone else can build a slightly bit bigger building, depending on how much FAR it is. So that, that's just another incentive we have out there. There are lots of these, and again, these get updated. The, the, the bonuses have gotten updated, but they're a big part of that Central City plan. The Central City 2035 will be rethinking that bonus structure to make it more workable and to make it to more closely tie it to sort of the city's goals, and especially where it wants to go in the Central City. So I'll get back there. So I often ask, I get asked why we have so many green buildings in Portland, and I usually point to a couple different things. One, I point to the, the, the design community here, which has really uh, taken upon themselves to become the premier leaders in this, and so that's, I'm looking again at you, uh, but our firms are working all over the world because they decided early on to adopt kind of a green ethos and really educate themselves and become the purveyors of green design. So I'm thinking, you know, there's firms in this room right here that are doing work because of the work that's happening here in Portland. So after that, I would also say we have a really kind of handsome environment for tax credits. Um, I'm speaking in particular about the business energy tax credits. They've been in the paper a lot. They're not a bad thing. They were just sort of slightly uh, mismanaged in terms of the larger uh, wind projects that are out on the east side of Oregon. But there is a business energy tax credit for sustainable buildings. So it gives you a per square foot uh, tax credit for building to lead. And I would absolutely point to that being a major success story for Oregon, and but Portland in particular. Um, that's why we have so many lead buildings, because you can basically pay for the certification through the tax credit. This starts to change now in this economy where, where there's less tax hunger. So there's just less appetite for these tax credits. And eventually, I do foresee that the tax credit system is going to go away. And I'm actually concerned what that will do for the green building efforts. Um, there's also some incentives through this tax credit for just energy efficiency improvements. So you can get per dollars on the equipment you're spending in the form of tax credits. And I would say every state should have this, but you also have to be aware on the flip side that it does take away from your revenue. So it has to be made up somewhere else. And that's why we're seeing that problem happening with the wind turbines. I talked about Clean Energy Works. Another reason why we have, uh, I would say, a good environment for green building is because of the work that the Bureau of Development Services has done to improve the process. So the development review process. <laughs> we often hear um, of other cities have what's called expedited permitting. We did an analysis of that, and actually Portland still is favorable for permitting in terms of time. It's partly like Chicago has an expedited permitting process. It, they cut the line at a very different spot of when that gets expedited. So in Portland, you have to come in with a lot of the work done, then your permit gets issued there. You, you know, your permit doesn't get issued all the way until the very end, and you know, just a small window of opportunity. So I feel very comfortable that, that Portland does a good job of this. We also have what I call a concierge services service for green buildings. It's called process management, where you end up working with just one kind of liaison through free BBS, and they help walk you through all the different bureau reviews, and they help they problem solve. You sit down with them kind of in an early assistance environment, and this is available to all lead projects. So that was something that came on early on. And then finally, one really innovative thing that's not getting used a lot now because we're just not building a tremendous amount at this moment is an alternative technology review committee. So let's say you want to spec a product that you know they've been using in Germany for 20 years that doesn't have the right UL listing or there's not enough of the ICC paperwork. You can go to this committee, which is made up of engineers. There's a couple city folks on it, but really professionals in the field, and make your case. And then you start setting precedent. So let's say you want to use some heat exchanger that is not currently <coughs> recognized in in North America, you could go to them and say, this is the documentation, this is how it performs, this is the liability that, or the, the insurance that I'm going to take out on it, and then you start setting the, the pathway for the following projects. We've seen only a few things come in through here, uh, specifically the Passive House. Mm -hmm. Are people familiar with that 
idea. They, they're going to start butting up against kind of the building code because they don't have heating systems. They're trying to use very efficient um, air exchangers that aren't available in the market here. And that's probably where we're going to see a lot of that kind of conversation happen. I'm very excited about it. And, and other cities are looking at this as a great opportunity to reduce those barriers and do it in a way that doesn't cause a lot of harm to the people who are doing that. Otherwise, you'd have to go through permit appeal after permit appeal after permit appeal and still get denied. And that's $10,000 plus design fees. And it just starts to add up. And so it's a great way to really massage the process. And then finally, uh, Oregon, specifically Portland, we have a fair amount of grants and rebates available. Most of that's through the Energy Trust of Oregon. If you're doing any type of efficiency improvement on an existing building or you're, you are working on a new construction project, go to the Energy Trust of Oregon's website first. You have to become sort of engaged in their process before you start installing anything or before you start specifying anything. But there are very, very handsome rewards for specifying as energy efficient equipment. And this is all money that we pay into. So your energy bills, there's a public purpose fee on there. That goes to the energy trust that then they disperse in the community. So it's your money, take advantage of it. And I would say that's why we have so many green buildings. That and we also have a very strong foundation through our zoning. A lot of things that we already do by nature here in Portland around stormwater, transportation, um, even you know, community where we cite things, it, it lends itself very well to the LEED process. But just entering in, I often say LEED Silver, you should just be doing it because you can, you're already there, and then the tax credits hit it. So it's a cost neutral proposition and I would recommend it. That's a picture of Mark that I drew. Um, <laughs> but I did want to just very quickly go over the six and then invite you Mark to join in here. So this is all in your perspective. You know, Portland has a zoning code that we should be proud of. And we, we are Portland because of our zoning code. We um, should be proud of it because it's so thick. We've been working on it for so long. It's big. It wouldn't yeah. even fit in this room. Yeah. Right. Um, but some people find that there are barriers to what they want to do and that what makes economic sense. And I would say it's a constant dialogue with the development community about what makes sense for Portland. Well, and I would just add to that. You know, the zoning code, again, is something that, um, I should stand up, I guess. Zoning code, uh, maybe one way to think about it is it's uh, clear and objective standards. So what, it, what its intent and what its primary function is, is to really prevent the worst, right? So ideally, you're preventing the worst. It's lots of no, you know, only do this much, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that over there, do this over here, only do this much, you know, that much, that percentage of that. It cannot encourage the best, right? It, it's, its primary function is to stop the worst from happening, hopefully, and to be kind of clear about that, which has kind of been an ongoing struggle, hence it gets really complicated really quickly. But so it's it's a st in the st <laughs> stick category because it's kind of seen as a hammer, right? I mean, it's kind of a, it's not something that we kind of trot out, like I didn't bring it here, you know, for, for obvious reasons, because it's not really an inspirational tool, really. It's kind of the way, though, that the community sees a lot of protection of their neighborhood character or a lot of sort of work that they've worked on finds its way into the zoning code because, it, the, you know, those little dimensions I talked about are sort of there for new development to kind of follow, which in theory is sort of, implementing community goals about where, where, they, where they see their community going and how new development should kind of help shape that future. So I'll just, I'll just say that. It's not a, let's get wildly excited about a lot of neat ideas about where the city's going kind of device. It's kind of a, how do we get things to happen? So equally uninspirational is the building code, although I would say that there's, you know, especially reading what's happened in, the, in Chile and Haiti, there's a great reason to have a building code, and it's a CYA um, approach. But from a green building perspective, the building code is just barely breaking the law. If you build the code, you're just, in my perspective, you're just barely not breaking the law. And I, so I would much rather us look at the building code as an opportunity to address true community issues, anything from hunger and homelessness. And this is me going up kind of on the field here, but the, the building code is, is so narrow and it's so about keeping buildings standing and keeping them safe, which is great. But there are other safety issues in our community um, of access to air. You know, we don't have a ventilation code in, in our residential. Uh, building code. So there's, you know, except for putting a bathroom fan in and a fan over your your exhaust your range, you don't have to have make sure you have the ventilation in your new tightly sealed uh, building is is much better than that. So I would love to see us address that type of thing. I'd love to see us address homelessness. I mean, why why would why should our building code only be available for some people? And and again, there's some people who are really kind of thinking about the building code as a way to add incentive to this. Right now, it's. Uh, it's there for a reason, it can be tweaked, but I also think it actually hinders the, our best creativity. And I think that's going to change. Actually, Oregon is in a code review process right now. They're looking at the international green uh, construction code as, a, as an option to adopt that. And it will set energy uh, requirements that will be along the lines of the 2030 
but also hopefully it will dovetail into things like water conservation, indoor air quality, um, maybe even stormwater management, etc. Okay, so why don't I just not spend a lot of time on sticks? I think, you know, really design review, that's a tough thing. If you've gone through it, you know it can be quite tough here in Portland. It's, it's a stick, it's to keep you in line. The market, the market's out of our control, but the market is definitely something that we constantly are playing to, and it, it either um, enhances things and advances green building, or as, as I said, as I see maybe with the tax credits moving, it might be a hindrance. And then finally, I can't talk about sticks without politics. I mean, building is a political act, and certainly any of the work that we're doing in our bureau, planning, design, building, it's very political, um, and you just need to read the fountainhead. You know that. <laughs> Let's skip this, because I, I want to get to what you can do. This, if you haven't been to the Armory, please stop by. It's a great inspirational space. It's the first Leeds Platinum historic uh, structure. I think this is the second one, actually, in the country. Um, is there still Leeds Platinum? You're gold? Okay, so I take that back. Sorry, you can take the side and be nice to me. Okay, <laughs> then I'll be sued. So let's go over here. Um, Mark, go ahead. So this is part of the video, you know, again, in, in terms of thinking about the, the greater context for the, um, if you click it one more time, Lisa, so the, the, at the top there is the armory and at the bottom is the schnitzer. So that you're thinking about the park blocks vision, so that the nighttime shot is thinking, trying to put, create again that new place. So what, what could the park blocks be? We have a lot of streets again in downtown and we need a little bit more hierarchy and we're looking for like, one of the ideas that came out of a process back a few years ago was maybe a North Beach like San Francisco kind of place. So a place to go after a big event, like you come out of the schnitz, and where do you go to kind of get your latte or your espresso or your ice cream or something like that? There's not a lot of places downtown to go. The park blocks, you can see all those little red squares, little res restaurants and bars along the way, nightclubs, that kind of thing. So we could enhance that character with maybe some incentives or something to get more restaurants and bars in there. And you have sort of a nice barbell kind of thing going on between the armory at the top, the brewery blocks, Powell's, you know, all that kind of reading, their, their cafe, the Schnitzer and PCPA down there at the bottom. So how do we kind of think about that? That's all. So we have some questions for you. I, I, want, I want mostly just to leave with this notion of what does a carbon constrained future look like? It does not look like the city we're living in now. And I, you know, as you as creative individuals, I want you to start thinking what our buildings need to look like, what our lawns need to look like, what you'll be driving, what you'll be eating. And I just think that needs to be reflected in how we design our buildings now. Uh, because buildings that are you know, not energy efficient, that are not conserving water, are not gonna be sustainable. They're not gonna be, uh, they're not gonna survive. They're not the, the fittest buildings. The buildings we're building now need to be the fittest buildings. The buildings we're retrofitting now need to be the fittest. Yeah, part of the problem too is, is education because there are new buildings that are built that are still not energy efficient because they're not being used properly. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say I call it the X factor, and we are the X factor. You know, if you as an architect can design the most efficient building that has the great model, as a you know a beautiful energy model, but you put people in, they start using water, they plug in more things than you anticipate, they use the elevator ten times more than you expect, and suddenly your green building's out the window. Um, so again, I get asked a lot what you can do. You know, you're a new professional or you're interested in this. I would say find your niche. Every, every one of us, there's a door for green building and all the things we talk about. There, there's a door for you to go through, and it, you don't have to be everything to everybody. But if you have a passion, that's where you should go. I mean, my my whole journey started in construction. That's where I started, and here I am talking about much more complicated issues. Be an advocate. If you're going to be in a firm, you need to be the voice, and I think that that lends itself nicely to uh, advancements because if they know they can go to you for the latest and greatest in sustainability, I think that's where you will find that you can advance and, and advance our causes as a, a universal community. We'd like you to work with us. We're not hiring now. We are in a hiring freeze, but um, there's certainly opportunities to do uh, to do collaborative work with us. And now we have a connection here that, or at least I have a connection that if we have projects that are kind of distinct, you as students can come and work on them. I would more than welcome that. And so I'll just keep that in mind. And I would just say, you know, with the Portland plan and the Central City 2035 planning processes, there's lots of opportunity for public. And we always appreciate, again, more the more design perspectives, the better, always at those kind of workshops. And again, talking about and being able to think, you know, critically and creatively about new solutions or things we may, we may not be able to do resources kind of put on the table. So kind of new ideas from the community are always welcome at those kinds of events and lots of opportunities in the, in the upcoming uh, months and years here. 
I'd like to thank Mark and Elisa for our wonderful presentation. They did their homework exactly what I asked for about the human side of how do you bring it all together to reach your sustainability goals. I have to go on a field trip. I'm really sorry I have to run, but I welcome you all to stay here and discuss with them all these really interesting ideas. Thank you, Nancy, for having us. Yeah. Thanks. And then just my last point on there is Portland's a small town. If you're going to work here, it is about networking. It's about who you know. Uh, get involved. There's a lot of opportunities to, to volunteer for different causes and organizations that are related to sustainability, that are related to the design field. And you know, just that's how that's how business is still done here. And then don't give up. I mean, I know that the 